I apologize for all of the technical difficulties we have been having today. The next uh, episode of Map Time is going to be on Edison Wax Cylinder, uh, a format that's more comfortable for historians. I see John Carter of Brown Library in our feed. Hooray, success. Bertie, can we get you in here? Let's see. Connect. Hello. All right. All right. Success. Hi, Bertie. Hi. Hi. Sorry about that. Sorry about uh, that. That's all right. <laughs> I was just saying that we're, we're, we're going to do our next episode by, uh, by correspondence. <laughs> I'll ask you a question by mail. And the next response will come back two weeks later, and it'll be very uh, 18th century Instagram. <laughs> Maybe uh, passenger pigeon, passenger pigeon. There's a future for them, I think, if there's any left. Exactly. <laughs> it's great to see you. Uh, Good to just see to you. introduce, I know m many of the people on have probably been on for the last uh, half hour, uh, as I've been trying to spin jokes and kill time. But for anybody <laughs> just joining, uh, this is the Map Time series. It's co-hosted by myself, Garrett Nelson, at the Leventhal Map and Education Center, and Dave Weimer at the Harvard Map Collection. Um, we have weekly chats with map people, people who make maps, people who collect maps, people who preserve maps and care for maps and write about maps. Uh, and we are so thrilled this week to have Bertie Mandelblatt from our uh, fairly near neighbors, uh, the John Carter Brown Library down in Providence, Rhode Island, joining us. So it's great, great. to see you. Well, yeah, good to see you. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation, and and I apologize to everybody watching for the technical difficulties. I I don't think we've yet had one of these that uh, goes perfectly smoothly. So uh, oh, good. It, what a relief! It's, what a relief! It's, it's actually yeah. like one of our <laughs> trademarks. So it's very okay for us to have a a long and drawn Excellent. out. Uh, weird, weird well, that's a, that's a very good brand, Garrett. That's a good brand. Yes. <laughs> Um, I've got your uh, amazing uh, map pulled up from the uh, from the JCB collections online, and I can share that. But I thought first, maybe, do you want to say something just about the JCB and uh, the map collection there, how it got to be there, a little bit about the the Brown family of Providence, Rhode Island, and which Brown uh, you are, uh, and uh, <laughs> and and a little bit about the the collection that you care for. Sure, sure. Uh, so the John Carter Brown Library is uh, an independent research uh, institution affiliated with Brown University, but not actually integrated into the Brown library system. Um, and John Carter Brown was a member of the Brown family who was a book collector in the, in the 19th century. And kind of famously at a given moment in 1846, he turned his attention to uh, a new and emerging subject um, that was uh, impassioning more and more people. And that was the subject of Americana. Um, that is, he decided from henceforth, he would buy only materials related to the Americas uh, in a truly hemispheric uh, vision. That is from the tip of North America to the tip of South America. Um, and so he started buying more and more material in that subject area. Um, his son, uh, John Nicholas Brown was actually the, the, he carried on collecting after his father died. And he was the one who was particularly interested in maps and atlases. And so the map and atlas and cartographic collection really grew under John Nicholas Brown at the end of the, end of the 19th century and the last couple of decades of the 19th century. And when John Nicholas Brown died, it was a provision of his will that the collection be housed separately. Up until that moment, it had been just a uh, a private collection housed in the in the Brown John Carter Brown and his descendants' house, and when John Nicholas Brown died in the early 20th century, a building was built for it. It's the building we're still in, which is on the campus, the main campus of Brown University. Um, but as I said, we're not actually uh, integrated into the Brown Library system. So the Brown Libraries has its own special collections. We're independent. We have our own endowment. We have our own fellowships. Um, so it's kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, it's an amazing kind of globally known map and atlas collection. I'm, I feel really lucky to be working with those with those uh, materials every day. Um, largely because, you know, he, John Nicholas Brown, picked up from his father, again, collected in the subject of the Americas, which is what we're still focused on. And certain things were on the market then that just don't come on the market anymore. So we were able to, because of a kind of a coherent 
uh, collecting policy, we were able to build this, this kind of unrivaled map and atlas collection in the area of the Americas over the last, you know, over 100, 150 years. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, are there any specific things you'd no, like to... No, I think that's great. Just, you know, it's, it's always great to think a little bit about how these objects got into these collections in the first place. And, you know, obviously the JCB has such an extraordinary collection of Americana and one of the first institutions to treat the Americas in such a comprehensive right. way. So uh, it's, so, it's so cool that we are jumping to South America with, uh, with the, the object that you brought today. Um, I'm going to flip my camera so that I can point it at your map and uh, tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here. Sure, sure. I should say that really from the beginning, the sense of um, the Americas was, as I said, hemispheric. So John Carter Brown and, and uh, subsequent librarians were very keen to, it wasn't simply, as you might think in New England in the, in the 19th century, very narrowly focused on the 13 colonies or on the, on, and then the United States, the Northeastern United States. It was always very much about this kind of trans-imperial vision, looking at, you know, the, 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 the Anglo-Atlantic, the French Atlantic, Spanish and Portuguese Atlantic, the Dutch Atlantic, um, always interested in idea of transatlantic connections of, in Africa, um, and so this is a great example of uh, a map that's um, drawn from our very, very rich kind of Guyana Suriname collections. We have a wonderful collection of maps dealing with the Guyanese coast. Uh, just to orient people who are, who are listening, um, the map is oriented with the Atlantic Ocean at the bottom of the map. So north is more or less uh, at the bottom, although the compass rose shows you exactly where north is, the arrow points to where north is. And so west is at the kind of top <laughs> right, and east is opposite, and of course south is opposite north. So that's the Atlantic Ocean at the bottom. And what we're seeing is in fact the Demerara River, which is the river, the course of the river that empties into the Atlantic on the left of the map, and the Essequibo River Delta, which is uh, largely figured in green, right? That's what you were zooming in in there. And what I really like about this map is it's extremely rich and it's rich in that it's balanced between being what we could, what we could say in a sense is a, wa a water map and a land map. And just to start with, mm -hmm. the, with the water, I mean, even the fact that the Atlantic Ocean is at the bottom of the map, that's very much a, a kind of a ship's view of the Guyanese and Suriname coasts. By the way, I should mm -hmm. say this is located in what is today British Guyana. That's that's mm -hmm. the area we're looking. Yeah. Um, so this is the way ships would have seen those coasts coming in, approaching the coastline from the ocean. Yep. But of course, that perspective at this point is at least 150 years old. This map dates from 1798, so it's very late 18th century, and in many ways, kind of embodies. Um, enlightenment science, enlightenment cartography. And we can see that in the really dense layering of mm -hmm. information. Uh, this color-coded key that, yeah. um, that corresponds between the, the very carefully laid out property lines and plantation plots in the map, and then the key at the bottom, the legend at the bottom of the map that you're showing right now. And so this legend points us, uh, shows us what commodities are being cultivated, uh, cacao, rice, tobacco. It talks about forested and abandoned land. It shows us which land is uh, en friche, meaning it's currently being cleared. Um, mm -hmm. It tells us where brickworks are, where sawmills are. I was, I was saying earlier that as I, as I was waiting, I... Yep. Yeah. Yeah, this this legend's so great. I had I had fun trying to find the sawmill. I saw I saw this. I was re reading the legend, and I saw the sawmill, yeah. and I was wondering where is the sawmill. And I'll look, maybe let you point it out later. But that for those viewers at home, uh, find the sawmill. It's a it's a fun exercise. <laughs> you you do a little while. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it is a little tricky because you have to you have to zoom in, and there's it's a, it's a yeah. large map. First of all, it's ninety two yeah. by sixty seven centimeters. It's a large map with a lot of information. Um, uh, maybe I'll talk just a little bit about, you know, the, when it was made, um, the kind of the form of the map. So the, the, the cartographer is a German military officer by the name of Friedrich von uh, um, 
let me, a Buschenroder, Frederick von Buschenroder, uh, as, the, as the cartouche indicates. And there's actually a lot more evidence for him being a military officer than a surveyor. But this map coming at the end of the 18th century um, shows really the, the great advances in surveying from earlier maps of the, exactly the same region that were made about 50 years earlier. It's a beautiful cartouche, kind of this iconography of the Americas that comes back over and over again. We see a pineapple, a, very, a kind of an, an odd but characteristically odd pineapple on the lower left of the cartouche, palm trees. Um, and yeah, if you scroll, if you, a little bit, that's right, there we have the pineapple there with a variety of palm trees. And there we have uh, von Buschenroder, 1798. And he, so the, the cartouche is in French, as you can see. Um, he himself is German, and he is dedicating it to the colonial com uh, committee um, of the Low Countries, of the Dutch col uh, colonial committee. In 1798, when the map was com completed, the colony had actually been British for two years. Um, starting in about the early 1780s, these, this territory began to change hands because of mm -hmm. warfare between the British and the Dutch that was related to the U.S. War of Independence, um, the American War of Independence. It wasn't kind of... The, the same war, but it was, it was warfare that kind of emerged out of that war. Um, and ultimately, the colonies ended in the, in the hands of the British. Um, uh, so, so in 1796, nonetheless, we see this map being produced and dedicated to the Dutch colonial committee, because before, before being um, uh, given to the, to the British, it had been Dutch, in fact, since the early 17th century when it was founded by the Dutch. So mm -hmm. we have this very dense layering of imperial uh, kind of competition, affiliation, um, uh, back and forth, a lot of uh, uh, inter-imperial hostility as well, all happening in the in the exact same region. Now, if you if, if you can scroll to the top of the map, yeah, yeah, I thought that the 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 overlays of language are so interesting here, right? A map that most um, of the text is in French. There's some Dutch names done by a German. Uh, military officer at a time that the territory in question is actually under British rule. Uh, that's that's quite a like uh, little vignette of European imperialism in the New World at this time. Yeah, and if you just scroll over to the top right quadrant of the map, you'll notice that there's mm. two inset maps: um, a large one and a small one. The smaller one. Um, gives us an overview of the entire region. That is, it locates the two rivers in relationship, again, to the ocean, but specifically to the Orinoco River Delta, which is another <laughs> major, major river system uh, of South, South America. That's right, exactly right there. That's the Orinoco Delta. And that red line that we're looking at, that actually gives us the limits of Spanish possession. Um, that's right, that red line. Um, because this is actually the... the the, the, the eastern frontier of um, the Spanish Empire, which is more focused in, on the western part of the continent, this far mm -hmm. north. Because yep. people um, and scholars who often focus too heavily on, in terms of the Atlantic world, on the northeastern part of North America, it's, it's really interesting to shift their ideas to think about, in fact, the Spanish at this point were consolidating themselves on the Pacific or western edge of the continent. So this is a frontier, but of a different kind. Um, so the Spanish limit, the limits of the Spanish are there. The Orinoco Delta is is an area that's um, kind of tossed back and forth between the English and the and the Spanish, and debated between the English and Spanish a lot. And then the Dutch colony, if if the left side of that little inset map is marked with the yellow line, you can see that, and that's the limits of another Dutch colony called Berbice. And so there is a Essequibo and Demerara position between them. And this, and this very small inset map is intended to show the kind of geographic connection. Yeah. Now the larger inset map, if you zoom out a little bit, shows the continuation of the rivers that the map is focused on. The, the, the two major rivers, the Demerara and the Essequibo. And in fact, that, that inset map, that larger inset map shows a third river as well. Mm -hmm. But my focus, as I said, like, so that, that's an interesting way of thinking about the, the water. So it's very much about navigating these river systems, right? The, the yeah. sh showing the tributary systems, showing the courses of these rivers, 
But if you zoom out to see the whole map, the first thing that strikes us is it's about land. It's about carving up this colony into plots that are able to be sold, that are able to be leased, that people can speculate on, that people can build plantations on. It's really about land. And, and what I think is going on here is that the water is meant to kind of serve the interests of the landholders, mm -hmm. which is kind of, that is, it's the landholders who need to know about the water. Um, if you focus mm -hmm. on that little text scroll that we can see just to the left, uh, of the of the Essequibo River, you see that little scroll that's in French, and that's all about uh, what what von Buschenroder is trying to communicate here is that is um, details about um, the the nature of the forests on either side of the of uh, the rivers, but also the impact of seasonal flooding on cultivation, um, trying to basically help landowners with the challenges that face them in. Uh, in in clearing this land and beginning to cultivate it. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, the presence of that scroll marks this map as the first state of the map. It's not a particularly rare map. A lot of uh, institutions have it. And certainly um, you have it in, at uh, the Leventhal. You've got a copy. I think Harvard mm -hmm. has as well. But I don't think you have the first state. Uh, the yeah. first state of the map has this scroll. And, and ours is in color too, which makes it a yeah. particularly rich one. Yeah, the color is really fascinating. And of yeah. course, that, you know, that interest in, in land holding and agriculture improvement is so transatlantic itself, right? I mean, and, I'm right. more familiar with the British context, but you have these, you know, landowners who are simultaneously kind of developing the tropics for sugar cultivation and then developing what become the kind of predecessors to urban parks, these country estates back in England and that that kind of connection between ex extraction and Central and South America and ideas about landscape that then brought back to landscape improvement in Europe is such such an interesting form of of kind of knowledge crossing economics and culture together it's so interesting to see here how much how the map takes such an interest in land improvement and what we would now call environmental management yeah i mean i think there's an aspect to that that does have to be underscored and and this is a perfect of kind of set of texts because of course text and image work really closely together in this map so um but it's a, it's a kind of a it's an interesting document to think about because you know this is intended for europeans uh, mm -hmm. european colonial administrators european land speculators european planters but the land is by no means only occupied by or even mostly occupied by Europeans. And if you scroll down to the legend one more time, at the far right of the legend, there's a circle, a red circle, that indicates the location of what the cartographer is calling Indian cabins and villages. In other words, indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. And if you scroll to the very top of the map, you'll see that, in fact, um, yeah, right to the top of the map, a top of the, where the river, the course of the rivers go. There's actually a, a real, uh, a really important um, kind of dense accumulation of these little red circles. You see them all mm -hmm. at the at the water's edge, where the, the the rivers branch, and you can imagine that this is actually quite densely populated by indigenous mm -hmm. people. Um, and so they, there is a presence. There is an, a very important indigenous presence on this map. And that tells a different story about exactly what you were just saying, resource management, mm -hmm. knowledge production. Um, I was speaking about this map with a couple of JCB fellows yesterday and two people said very, made some really interesting comments. One was that, um, you know, the usefulness of this river for the planters is of, of course the fact that you can navigate up and down it, but who's actually doing the navigating? Who's the, who are the, who mm -hmm. are the boat? They're most likely indigenous people. Are they using mm -hmm. this map, for example? Is this a map yeah. that they could use to navigate? Well, absolutely not. You know, that's why, I mean, the water, there's a huge amount of detail about water here, but it's really being put to the service of European land uh, property holders. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you've got so, these routes like passage, passage of the Indians that are just kind of sketched. Right, from exactly. Point here. Exactly. So, um, and another JCB fellow I was speaking with yesterday made the comment, and, and I think he's absolutely correct, that it's a really interesting process 
of um, what you're seeing actually actively happen is indigenous people being eradicated from the imagined landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and you see the process through which that is happening. You see the chopping up into these, these, these kind of, these right angled grids, yeah. land that absolutely does not correspond to this. Because of course this, this landscape, this ecosystem is, is anything but a, a tidy kind of um, temperate uh, uh, agricultural, the kinds of agricultural lands that we are familiar with around here, for example. Yeah. This, is, these are, this is a very humid area. The, the, the land is waterlogged. Hence the discussion of, of the impact of seasonal flooding. Um, and this is truly kind of an aspirational map yeah. that wants to see the land as able to be uh, apportioned into these very regular plots. But yeah. it, was, it was a great struggle to do it. Yeah. And that, of course, relied not only on moving the indigenous peoples out, but bringing enslaved Africans in to do the work of sugar cultivation, right? Absolutely. So the kind Absolutely. of the, the European dream of this productive, orderly, economically generating landscape um, relied on these huge racialized movements of people in and out of absolutely. the landscape. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely true. And I think just seeing that the kind of collection of those red dots at the top of the map, it's, it's a really, um, you know, what we're looking at is a document that was actively involved in moving indigenous people out of their land, off their land, relegating them, um, uh, you know, moving them away from the coasts, releg um, relegating them to the margins of what became and what was understood to be productive society. Yeah. Um, and as you say, of, of, of course, the other untold story here is that lands, these plantations didn't work themselves. I mean, it's, they're, it's completely integrated with stories of transatlantic um, slavery. Can I ask you a question about the, the this um, division of land? Uh, I was looking here um, along mm -hmm. the coast and up the Demerara River and um, Dutch colonial land use is not my specialty at all. Uh, these to me are the classic French long lot systems with the back canal with each lot, uh, you know, has uh, frontage on, on the shore um, and draining backwards to the canal. You, of course, you see these on the lower Mississippi and uh, Louisiana and in other, uh, you know, along the St. Lawrence and parts of Wisconsin. Uh, were the Dutch, did the Dutch also use long lots or is this French influence on the area? Well, the Dutch were masters at water management, <laughs> mm -hmm. going, back, going back centuries at this point. Um, you know, the Spanish brought the Dutch in very early uh, in Mexico City to try to help them manage the, the, the flooding in Mexico City. Uh, so there's a very, very long history of Dutch um, water management, use, uh, what, you know, the Dutch using the techniques that had been de developed in the Low Countries yeah. in the Americas, both, both for their own account, but also um, kind of on contract to, to other imperial powers. Um, you're right that the long lots that they resemble very closely the kind of the layout of plantations in the in the Caribbean and also in New France. Um, the uh, as far as I, I I'm afraid I cannot answer that uh, that question definitively about the Dutch. I haven't done a ton of research on the form of Dutch plantations. I think this is really responding to the geography of the area. Um, uh -huh. That is the presence of the river delta, the presence of the Atlantic. And, and the need for access to water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's such a, it's such a fascinating landscape. And um, this, of course, is the city of Georgetown now. So I, I couldn't quite pick up uh, the agricultural pattern, um, whether, it's, uh, whether it's still in use today up the river. But um, yeah, really, really interesting form of, of land division. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, and 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 that's what that's another really interesting aspect of it is it's got this, um, you know, it's this combination of a very late 18th century kind of enlightenment view of things with a much older, much more archaic kind of cartographic uh, yeah. vision. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, something. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, anything else you want to say? I thought we could maybe open it to questions if anybody has uh, anything that they want to chime in, but any any last things that you want to make sure we talk about? Um, let me think. No, I think I've covered my main, uh, the main points that I wanted to uh, to talk about. Um, 
but uh, yeah, no, let's open it to questions. Absolutely. Let's see what people are interested in, in talking about. Sure. So if anybody has any questions, you can, you can type them right in this little comment field. But if you, if you see on Instagram, there's like, uh, looks like flashcards with a question mark on them, you can submit them that way as well. Um, and I should say, I, I didn't mention at the beginning, of course, that the JCB library has uh, an excellent digitized collection. That's what I'm looking at right now. Um, you probably didn't, uh, if you're watching on Instagram, you didn't get the full resolution of these maps because uh, it gets a little blurry on my camera, but make sure you get a chance later to, to jump over to the JCB's website and take a look at both this and others uh, in their full high res glory. So it looks like we have a, had a question from the Menagerie Archive. What would you call these kind of maps? Uh, you mean what kind of, what genre of map? Let's, well, there, there's no hard and fast kind of map classification system. Um, although Garrett, I mean, you can answer this as well as I can, thinking about your work with your own collection. Um, I would certainly say, because the predominant usage of this is, is, is really about land, that it's, it's a kind of a, a uh, it's, it's a, it's a map that's intended to depict um, property ownership. Plantation. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. It, it, it has all the markings of an early cadastral map. Of course, it doesn't show owners' names, but it, 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 I thought it was interesting what you said at the beginning. It's almost like a, a halfway between a coast chart and a, and a cadastral map. That's such a, an interesting uh, way that this is situated, like lit literally at the edge of land and water. Yeah, I should have said, actually, this is something that would... Um, I should have mentioned earlier, is that this map was actually accompanied by two folio uh, printed leaves that, in, in fact, do list owners' names um, mm -hmm. so that they can be keyed to the, to the actual plantations the, and the kind of commodities that they're growing. So in that oh, sense, it is much closer to a complete kind of cadastral survey. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, text and image working in really interesting ways together. Yeah. Yeah, and the JCB only owns those two leaves as well. Um, and in fact, they're available if Luna database, they're there. Bell has a good suggestion that we should we should post the digital collections links ahead of time so that people want to bring it up on their computer while they watch. That's a that's a great idea. We should uh, in the future give it give a link. But I'm sure um, we'll we'll put up a link of this particular map on on um, our feed and maybe JCB as well so that uh, people can take a look at it. It's funny. I and it, as you mentioned, we also have. Uh, a less impressive non-color version of a later state uh, in the BPL holdings. And as I was doing a little background research earlier this week on the Essequibo River and the colony, um, the Wikipedia article features the BPL version of this map, <laughs> which some enterprising Wikipedia user had uh, put up since our maps are in the public domain. So I kind of chuckled to dis discover one of our own collections as I was trying to learn about yours. Right, right. Yeah, and I can actually send you the 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 links to the two the two leaves with um, the names of property owners as well because that that would be an interesting you know it's to to, to think of them as a as a set of documents that work together is is particularly interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't see any more questions. I was going to give away the answer. I said, can you find the sawmill? Uh, it took me a little while to find. Um, so for those of you at home, the sawmill <laughs> is way up here on the Demerara River. And of course, they should have known you can only have a mill upriver. You know, rivers aren't fast moving enough down by their mouths to to, to turn a, a mill. Uh, so I should have thought to look up there. But there is the sawmill uh, way up on the river. Right. So it's a beautiful map, Bertie. It's so interesting to learn about it from you, and I'm so glad we finally got you on. Uh, can't wait to see you in person once we are all back to moving around. And uh, tune in next week um, for our next installation of Map Time. Uh, we'll be back to Dave at the Harvard Map Collection next week.